Unfortunately, the Hawks went to water in miserable conditions at Giant Stadium this past Sunday. The team still looking for a way back onto the winners list. We'll recap all the action from that clash and look ahead to a massive game at Marvel Stadium against the Adelaide Crows. Also this episode, a very special guest that we're so excited to chat with. So, plenty ahead on this edition of the Hawk Talk podcast. My name is Nick Mason and Tiz, I don't know about you, but um, I'm kind of craving a win these days. Oh, would that have anything to do with the fact that it would be our 1,000th win? Well, that's a nice little footnote, but no, more the fact that we haven't won since you know, the end of May or whatever it is. It's been about five games now. I'm hungry. Well, we weren't too bad in this match, Nick, were we? I mean, we were in it for much of it. And a lot of people say that, you know, uh, wet weather is the great leveller, but uh, absolute crap. Talent (laughs) is brought to the surface every time there's wet weather. I saw it with Aaron Lord at the MCG one day when he just kept kicking goals. And I saw it on the weekend as well. All the top draft picks were very good, did you notice? Well, that's true, but the guy that caught my eye was one Tom Mitchell. uh, 35 touches, 14 in the second quarter. So talk about a guy that was trying to will us over the line in the wet. I think he he put his heart and soul into it. Seven tackles, five clearances, 519 metres gained, and voted MVP by the fans, rightly so, I would say. Yeah, it was good to see him back in the guts. I thought Harry Morrison was absolutely incredible. Um, in the effort he put together. Yeah, 25 touches for 638 metres gained, six tackles, seven inside 50s. This is the stat I like. 36 pressure acts, the most of any player out there. So that's Hawks and Giants. 16 of those were in the defensive half. And I don't remember a game where Tom and Harry have performed that well together in in the same contest. Um, So it was, you know, we, we, we lament our midfield and it's individually... They're usually, you know, one of or two of them will bob up a game. It's just the cohesion between them. It's uh, it's quite strange. It's uh, it, it's like a mirage in the desert. It, it almost <laughs> looks like it, it's there. You're getting a bit closer to it all working, and then all of a sudden it, it's a bit further off. It's uh, the rainbow kind of effect there. I'm getting a bit over that oasis in the distance, <laughs> <laughs> I've got to tell you. Because, I mean, O'Meara also didn't have such a down game by any means. He found the footy enough. He was one of our better performers, but I think you're right. It's, it's just, you know, that troubleshooting still underway, unfortunately, as far as a midfield is concerned. And, I mean, Ned Reeves was excellent as well, you know, against Matt Flynn, who's also pretty much a fledgling ruck, 39 hitouts, five clearances. There's, um He's still carrying that injury, so that's an excellent performance. Yeah, he basically broke even, which is uh, which is great. To be one of our better performers in the wet, for, for, you know, his nickname's Noodle. It says it all. For such a tall, uh, typically immobile guy to still do so well in the wet and get, I think it was nine contested touches as well. Uh, Ned Reeves is flying under the radar a little bit, I think, as far as Hawthorne fans are concerned. I think he's going to be very valuable. Now, you've got James Sisley, obviously, has to get a mention. 26 touches, 68% DE, disposal efficiency, that is. Our second best user of the footy for the game, 962 metres gained, which is ridiculous, in, especially in wet weather. Uh, 15 in- intercepts and, and never left the field of play. But where's Hardwick? Because the whole game we were asking, where's Green? Where's Hardwick on this list, Nick? Nah, but Tiz is all by design, you see. He's that underrated that I don't even put him on the rundown anymore to see if you notice. Oh, so it's a, it's a test for me, is it? That, that's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, a little bit mean on my part, but no, I mean, he, magnificent again, and, and certainly underrated, uh, it kept Toby Green, was it goalless? I don't think Toby Green had a goal, did he? No, he did not, and that ended his streak, as was Mitchell Lewis's streak ended, oh, unfortunately. Yeah, talk about talk about me laying a trap, you've laid a trap, <laughs> that's the only reason why you wanted to talk about Toby Green at all. <laughs> oh, it's alright, you can take your hands off your eyes now, Nick, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, I really thought he was going to keep that streak alive, my boy Mitch, but no, nah, it wasn't to be. Oh, it was so tantalising, that last kick of the game. Oh. Tough kick, of course, and he's had a magnificently accurate year, but it wasn't to be. But no, circling back to Blake Hardwick, uh, he hasn't gotten, gotten the plaudits that he probably deserves of late. Toby Green is such a dangerous player, and I, I won't go so far as to say he didn't have any influence, but not in the typical characteristic way that he usually does. Oh, no, it was an excellent performance. Uh, and you, 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 you can't buy that kind of... 
I, I want to call him the cook because he, he really puts the mockers on a celebration. He does. <laughs> <laughs> now, something we couldn't buy, Tiz, was a goal. Uh, in our second term, 24 inside 50s for no goal. Yeah. Not a sausage. Yeah. Now, the uh, the forward line structure really broke down. Mitch Lewis uh, was starved for impact, but, you know, it's it's not something that's that's happened this year. It was, it was surprising. Well, I reckon just our entire identity in terms of our game plan just sort of went out the window with the weather. I've got to assume there's no more run and gun when it gets that splishy sploshy like it just we couldn't get that going and when you take that away from Hawthorne I mean modern day Hawthorne I'm not sure what's left it wasn't terrible we've played worse than that but there wasn't there didn't appear to be any logical system to what we were doing and that I think was I think was felt most immensely when it came to forward uh efficiency and conversion well, I mean, other coaches have gone to town on our run off half back, and the players are being exposed for their uh, lack of experience. To be quite honest, in uh, in in bringing the ball down the field, but uh, in when we speak about lack of experience, I mean, we had fourteen players on Sunday that were twenty three and under, twelve of them with less than fifty games, and you know it's. It, this is the rebuild. This is what it is. And now... This is everyone in every section of the footy media getting what they asked for. Hawthorne, don't go to the draft. They're too old. And it's like, well, we're doing it. Are you happy? We're bloody doing it. This is what it looks like. Hang on, hang on. When We're going to get a free agent though, right? I've been hearing all this scuttlebutt about Carl. <laughs> Another Port Adelaide player coming across to Hawthorne. Sounds good, doesn't it? They're doing so well. <laughs> oh, come on <laughs> they're doing a bit better than when we faced them earlier in the year but I, I would like Carl on the list Carl Amon I think he's got a spot at Hawthorne for sure on the wing obviously yes that's right yep it just fits neatly doesn't it Carl Amon on, on the wing for us beautiful kick it costs a bit but I find it terribly exciting pretty pricey but uh, allegedly that the reports have come out this week is that uh, we are the front runners for securing the signature of Carl Amon. I mean, you know, what well, we're getting into round 18 now. There's still a lot of time in this. There's a lot to play out, but yeah, you, you don't mind it. Of the free agents, I, I am interested in him. Hawthorne's long been interested in securing the services of Carl Amon, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, back to that second term, though, it wasn't just the, the inside 50 conversions. We lost contested possessions in that part of the ground by 15. Uh, ground ball gets by 9. Our disposal efficiency was 35%. I don't know how much we credit that to just the weather, uh, if we just attribute that to the conditions out there. GWS weren't that flash either by foot, but there was a time where a great stretch of the game where it was costing us, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I mean, the loss of Warple early on in the match did not help our contested possessions whatsoever. Yeah, it's true. And he did have a positive start to the game. More questions about about Warple now. Um, Warple may miss the rest of the year. We're not sure whether he's able to play with that injury. Have we heard from the club yet? G'day, Hawkers. Just a quick update as so much has happened since we hit record just last night. Uh, it's been confirmed that James Warple will miss the remainder of the season as will Lockie Bramble with a back injury. Jack Gunston will indeed miss this week's game for obvious reasons. That's something we discuss a bit later in the episode. Uh, And some big news, pun fully intended, the return of Ben McAvoy. Now, by the time this episode goes up, it'll be about an hour from the squad being announced. So, you know, bear with us if anything else is totally dated when that rolls around. Anyway, let's jump back in. The interesting part is, is Tom Mitchell declaring that he wants to stay at Hawthorne. Again. Yes, yes. Everyone wants to say it, Hawthorne Tiz. It's exactly the position that we don't want to be in all of a sudden. <laughs> Great that you love the club, but it's just not really what we're all about right now. No, come <laughs> on. I, oh, look, it's up to Sam to make it work as far as I'm concerned. I think they're both excellent players. He just can't get the mix. No, no, that's right. No, it is, it is on Sam to make it work. The senior coach has, has got to troubleshoot this and figure it out. And just off that, can I just make it clear that me? If we're up to me, I'm not pushing either out the door all of a sudden. I don't know. No, you want both out the door, don't you, Nick? <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> well, I want to know what our options are. I think we would be foolish in this stage of where the club's at to not entertain offers and look at what we can what we can do. 
But my default position is not to usher them on from Hawthorne to anywhere else. I would rather retain them. I suppose with that, uh, I, I have faith that Sam can work it out. Something else that needs working out is uh, what's going on at Box Hill at the moment. Um, because if you're looking for pressure on these midfielders that we're talking about that they are underperforming, it's it's just not coming from the seconds. I mean, the second half was a bit better, but GWS had it all over for talent. Uh, I know they've had many, many concessions from the AFL for years, but uh, non-competitive in the first couple of quarters there. Yeah, a bit of deja vu all over again from Box Hill, which is unfortunate. I don't know if you recall, mate, um, it would have been uh, in our WhatsApp chat maybe about three weeks ago that uh, I just mentioned to you offhand that looking at Box Hill's fixture, uh, there's a really good chance to entrench themselves in the top four. They've not done that. They've, they've made a mess of the last fortnight, unfortunately. The, the wet and wild conditions were going to make it tough for either side, but Giants made it look easy in that opening term. Box Hill did not come to play, and, and GW, GWS got the ascendancy, just like Footscray did the week before. We had no answer to their midfield dominance, and that was the game very early, early on. They got out to a comfortable lead and held us at arm's length, and that was it. That's not to say that there weren't any positives. I thought two AFL-listed players' tiers were definitely the shining lights on the day. Uh, who would that be? That'd be uh, one Josh Ward and Finn McGuinness. Starting with Ward's stats here, 27 touches, three marks, five tackles and eight clearances and a goal. He did look surprisingly comfortable and composed in spite of the conditions, which got really bad. So to have someone that was actually half decent with uh, polish in his disposal was actually really good. And, and we'll get to Finn in a sec, but Ward played a mixture of wing and inside mid. Both these guys did. And um, I liked the look of him. I, I want him back in the senior side, and this only fuels that hope, I suppose. Can we have a drum roll for the Finn McGuinness? Because it's about bloody time we saw him back at AFL level, mate. 28 touches, 15 of those contested, uh, plus four tackles and five clearances. Uh, like Ward, a mix of wing and uh, inside mid. The second half was where he spent time as an inside mid. That's where he had a much improved output. Uh, which really begs the question, Tiz, why aren't we seeing it? Colour me shocked. Colour <laughs> me shocked, I tell you. Anyway, Dino says, what does the lack of urgency or seeming lack of interest in giving Finn a look in the middle tell us about the coaching staff's thoughts on him? He's got the size and from a small sample looks good when dishing off the handball to release another mid. Um, well, I guess, Dino, that they know what he can do and are they just auditioning or trying to work out how the AFL midfield works at the moment? I honestly can't see the point of leaving him back there any longer. No, you've got to give him a go, and especially with the next three weeks coming up. They're not, they're bottom of the table teams, Crows, Eagles, North. Are you telling me this is not the time to experiment? We know we aren't playing finals. That's not in our future. These teams aren't either. Let's just have a go, have a crack. And Finn's, Finn's not going to develop any more than he has down at that level. Absolutely agree with that. Like, we don't want him becoming a VFL player. That can definitely happen to some, some guys. Michael asks, how long do players like Emerson Jekka sit in the twos while we're getting spanked? Is the VFL program actually setting us up with the depth we need? There are concerns over some of the players that we've been looking at. Um, you know, they haven't really kicked on this year. Um, I think if we think back to last year and how we were looking at about this time, do you, do you feel that there'll be a similar uptick in our performance going into the end of the year? Or are we, have we got wiser heads on board keeping our draft picks lower? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, Nick. What, what do you think? I don't, I don't really have any concerns over the development of, of some of these players, uh, I think they're um, they're quite undermanned in uh, in certain aspects and, and quite young at the VFL level. Uh, and there is there is quite a big um, difference between the performance you have to have in an AFL side that's not doing very well. Uh, the lines aren't working well together. They're not performing well. They're going through a slump. And how much harder that is than uh, than learning in the VFL. People won't discuss it because they've looked pretty good for the most part, Box Hill. They've let themselves down the last fortnight. But I'd argue that it hasn't necessarily been a particularly lucky year. Uh, there's been quite a, 
a few unfortunate setbacks. Um, I'd say, you know, with the the senior team's problem with the ruck stocks, uh, had a flow-on effect to Box Hill. I think suddenly we were using Cozzy and Callow in the ruck. Didn't really want to do that if we didn't have to. Eventually, we would get uh, Brinker Ritchie in and try and, you know, Box Hill would get some relief from that conundrum and then that would have a flow-on effect for us. Great. Um, Emerson Jecker with, uh, what, like a five, six-week hamstring completely derailed him just as he looked like he was getting into some good form after a slow start. Um, the likes of uh, Seamus Mitchell... And Connor Downey, we won't see for the rest of the year, it looks like. Uh, Ned Long has had his, has had his own... Uh, hamstring. Well, I think he had COVID, but also uh, his hamstring. And now that he's back in the side, looks a, a ghost of what he was. Um, there's all these little things that are adding up. And it looks worse than it actually is. I think we've been quite unlucky. What that spells for some of the players, though, and I am looking at the likes of Downey and Mitchell... Could they fall off the list as a result? They might be a bit stiff, but it might come to that. Tell me about DGB, because it appears that he has hit a real, well, a, t- a rough patch. He's, he's not doing anything that particularly excites me and, and wants me to recall him immediately. And, and, and part of that is to do with how Blank has impressed inside two games. Um, you know, Jesse Hogan was was doing a number on us in that first half. And, you know, part of that, as good a game as Sicily had, part of that was the matchup Sicily and Hogan. And then uh, Blank was moved on to him and, dare I say, blanketed him. Yeah, absolutely. But the concentration levels of, of Blank are fantastic. You've got to admire that. He takes the game on. He's got courage. He's got dare about his game for a big guy. Um, I'm not needing to rush DGB back into the side. And I know that'll be controversial with some listeners. I know there's a, a huge chorus of Hawks fans that say, what is the point in having him at uh, VFL level back at Box Hill? Well, the fact of the matter is that he's been kind of average. We're definitely looking like a bottom four side now, Nick. Yeah, we are. Yeah, and this is something that <laughs> we did initially predict. In fact, I think you were very big on this and you've been proven correct that in the second half of this season, we were going to falter. We were going to slow. We were going to look a bit worse. Um, I think maybe the wins that we have banked did deceive us momentarily, but the fact of the matter is that your initial call on season 2022, I think, was correct. Um, but as for Box Hill, they're, they're at risk of dropping out of the eight now, and uh, that could happen when they take on the Southport Sharks at Box Hill City Oval, Saturday, 12.35 p.m. Southport Sharks uh, from up on the Gold Coast, they're second on the ladder. They've won five on the trot. All five they've won pretty convincingly. Uh, this is going to take a big effort from Box Hill. So um, they're just going to rebadge Gold Coast because apparently... Some foot, football teams can be successful on the Gold Coast. We're just <laughs> merging into the Southport Sharks. It's a much better name for a, for a start. I Southport <laughs> Sharks is a great and great logo as well. Yeah. That being said, I hope we obliterate them. <laughs> Which, no slow starts. Fortnight of slow starts for Box Hill absolutely kills my interest in watching the rest of the game because they get pummeled from the outset. And I'm like, oh, come on, boys, switch on. Give us a contest, for God's sake. Anyway, the thing about Box Hill is I actually don't know, beyond Ward and McGuinness, who we bring in for this week, Hawthorne versus Adelaide at Marvel Stadium, Sunday, 3.20 p.m. Warpool comes out. Day comes out with his suspension just the one week. Uh, Ward and McGuinness, I expect, would come in. There is the question, though, Tiz, and it's sad for us to get onto this topic, but Gunston could take personal leave. By the time people listen to this, they'll have the team, I expect. But do you reckon Gunston takes a week off considering the passing of Ray Gunston, his father? Uh, that's my expectation. You know, a shocking uh, thing to happen and, and out of the blue. And, um, yeah, he'll have he'll have the wind taken out of his sails. If he does play, it'd be an amazing effort from the man. Yeah, I wouldn't say that anyone is part of the Hawthorne family, not teammates, staff, fans. There's no expectation for him to play. It's kind of ridiculous in a way. I'd prefer that he takes a week off. I think that's what's required with you know times such as these. And uh, Ray Gunston, huge figure of the game, massively influential. And, and the stories come out of the way that he supported Jack as well. It was really quite touching and heartwarming. So our thoughts are with... 
the Gunstons, uh, the entire family, everyone that's been affected, and uh, yeah. So he'll be commemorated with some black armbands for the game, and uh, I'm sure he'll be mentioned by the club on the day. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Just another storyline into... um, you know, what is, it doesn't have finals implications, this game, but it's certainly interesting for both clubs that are just trying to work their way back to something, trying to build towards something. And I don't know, do you make any more changes? I mentioned Ward, I mentioned McGuinness coming into the side. Uh, I imagine you're for those two changes. Yeah, absolutely. I want to see some young faces in the side. I want to see Dash and Dare against an opposition that really won't hurt us um, and that we can you know, look to expose them. I just hope it's played in a in an entertaining manner. I don't want a duel at 10 paces or something where it's highly defensive. I, I want them really trying to run and gun. 14th playing 15th this week. We've won one of our last three against the Crows, that being the game that we attended, Tiz, in Tassie. Yeah, but, you know, if you look before that, we've really had the wood over the Crows. So we usually find a way. Adelaide have won two of their past five games, wins coming against North and West Coast, which should say a little bit about where they're at. They've played some tough opposition, yes, but their wins haven't set the world on fire either. Uh, some questions here from listeners. Jason, uh, what's next for where we're specifically at? Cotton Wool, some senior players, especially those who are injury prone towards the end of the year to give kids experience or play the A-team as much as possible? Uh, you've got to find out what the kids are made of. I think we've been promoting that for a while. But but also you've got to let them give them time to gel, give them a taste of you know before they hit the preseason again, and they have to do all the hard yards and hopefully build a body like Mitch Lewis has. And can I just say that the A team is uh, TBC? Frankly, round eighteen of the first year under Sam Mitchell. Um, I think we've learned this year that that's still in flux. We're discovering what the A team is, and uh, that's how the back end of the season should be used is working that out. Before we get to Numo's question, we're generally finding how important uh, Frost, who signed on again, uh, signed a new contract, is for that defence line. Yeah, his absence is definitely noticeable. Uh, this question from Numo, can Jack Scrimshaw play on a wing full-time for us? He has a beautiful kick, can attack and defend, and is tall and deceptively quick. Could we use DGB or Frost to allow us to try this in the next month? Well, perhaps this answers the question why there haven't been many people tried on the wing because we know Carl Amon's coming, Nick. Is that... <laughs> oh, uh... That's 4D chess. That's 5D chess. Yeah, well, no point in trying stuff that, you know, anyway. No, they need a backup. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, answer the question. What Numo wants to know if Jack Scrimshaw can play wing. Of course he can, but I'd rather see... GF play wing because he's been a bit of a liability in defence. So push him up the ground and uh, let Jack do what he loves. Yeah, I I would suggest the same thing. I like Jack Scrimshaw where he is because he's too damn good at it for me to want to tamper with his position on the ground. Uh, I reckon Impey or GF, we need to get a spark out of either of those guys. They have been very much out of sorts and I I, I want to turn that around for them because we know how bloody talented and exciting they can be. They have looked uh, not themselves of late. Mind you, I will say, credit to Giath, he did have the best disposal efficiency of anyone, uh, the game just gone. Really? Yeah, but I think it was 83 or something. You've shocked me, honestly. That that does shock me. Credit to him, he does usually hover around 80 plus percent. He's a good user of the footy. Uh, Lauren has asked, should it be concerning that we've only had one rising star nom as a developing side? I'd love to see a few more, Nick. I really would. Just a few standout performances would be great. Um, When you spend your best picks on defenders, you're really not going to get any (laughs) rising star (laughs) noms. So Yeah, it's true. They don't always uh, capture the eye like some other players. I I don't think we should be concerned. I I think it's tougher than people uh, take at face value to to get a rising star nom. You're up against an entire weekend of footy. Like You've got to be the player. It takes a bloody good performance. But that being said, I think uh, Connor McDonald's time might be coming. Oh, I hope so. He sh- he should be able to stand up against some of these less organised sides. He won't take out the award. It won't be the number one at year's end, but uh, I would be shocked if he didn't have one coming. He is consistently know, very watchable, is Connor McDonald, isn't he? Look, you're preaching to the converted, mate. Preaching to the choir. This is broadcast, mate. We are doing this for a bunch of listeners. 
<laughs> anyway, that is Hawthorne versus Adelaide in a nutshell. Marvel Stadium, Sunday, 3.20pm. We'll both be there. But for now, uh, it gives us great pleasure. You know, speaking of the listeners, Tiz, uh, this will be very well down on her extensive resume. We've got a special guest, Meg Hutchins. And let's go through the CV. It is quite spectacular. 250-plus uh, games, six-time All-Australian, 2018 VFLW Premiership Hawk, we were there, mate. Uh, women's Football Talent ID and Recruitment Officer, Hawthorne VFLW Player Development Mentor this year, and uh, look, a significant and influential figure in the growth of women's football and a footy journey to that spans a good couple of decades. What a delight it was to have a chat with Meg Hutchins about uh, her expansive playing career, uh, reflections on our VFLW campaign this year, the AFLW list, the draft, uh, the tantalising round one game we've got ahead of us now because the fixture's out, mate. The AFLW fixture's out. I've written it down in my diary. Every game, can't wait. And of course, getting into the uh, the future directions for women's footy. It's a great and very entertaining chat with Mick Hutchins. Here it is. G'day, Mick. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Hawk Talk podcast. Uh, it's been a bit of a goal for us for, for a little while now to get you on board because... We've been riding the bumps with the grin with the uh, the VFLW season, and, it's, and what a season it was! Uh, amazingly exciting and entertaining, and uh, it's great to have you on board. Oh, thanks so much! Yeah, it's um, you know, obviously a long time listener, first time caller, I guess. So <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. It's um, yeah, it's really really great. That is hugely flattering. I, I say it to Tiz a bit. It, it does occasionally sneak up on us just who listens to this podcast i'm like oh okay oh. well I, I do have a, i do have a drive sort of every every couple of days um a week back to melbourne for for trainings and stuff so it's good it's good to tune in <laughs> lovely lovely to have you we want to start with your expansive playing career um your aflw debut in the inaugural aflw match at icon park is it's only really part of the story i'm i'm, I'm well aware i'm jumping in the middle but uh that very special game um that I remember being at. Talk us through that evening and, and the vibe of that, because that's a very like landmark event in terms of uh, women's football, but women's sport as well. Yeah, it's um, you know, every now and again I, I sort of reflect on it and realise how big a moment it actually was. Um, at the moment in time, it was yeah you know, really a, a game of football that we were preparing for, and, and a, I mean reasonably large one at that. You know, in in terms of the debut game of the whole competition and and for all of us really it was the biggest game we've ever played in so um yeah but upon reflection you do sort of have to take a moment and realize how monumental it was in the history of um, women's sport and and then obviously the AFL itself um yeah it was quite it was a warm day I do remember it quite it was a warm day I think it was about 30 odd degrees so I was thinking yeah it'd be beautiful to be in the crowd nice sort of (laughs) twilight game I I had family that had come down from Queensland and sort of from all around the state. Um, they were going to the, a beer garden somewhere to chill out and, uh, <laughs> and and soak it all in before they walked to the game. So, um, and it was actually um, my birthday on the day as well. So, oh, really? there you go. Yeah, so it was a, it was a good whammy. Um, yeah, it was a, it was an in, it was an incredible day. Um, I guess the main thing for me that I remember is that you you run out for the initial um, pregame warm up. Um, and we sort of just, yeah, going about our thing and and you have a bit of a look around and, and you sort of realise that, oh, yeah, it's a reasonably good crowd here. Um, you know, it's it's uh, yeah, it's kind of pretty special. It's a really beautiful night for football. and um, But then, you know, we went back inside and, and then you come back out um, for the, you know, to go through the banner and everything like that and to do your lap and you're just like, oh, my gosh, this is completely full here. Um, and I And I vividly remember we went, you know, we ran um, as a sort of warm up lap and we ran past the, you know, basically along the wing and basically everyone was just clapping and cheering and it was both clubs that were doing it. Um, almost, it kind of almost felt, I don't know whether it was, but it almost felt like a bit of a standing ovation just being there um, and being part of it. So, you know, we, we all kind of, you know, took it in, I guess, and, and um, let the moment sort of get the better of us, but in a good way um, early on. And then, yeah, then it, it was the sort of the, the roar of the crowd and everything like that, and you sort of just get on in and um, crack in and play the game. But then, obviously, the aftermath, you realise how, um, you know, once you get your phones given back to you, you realise, <laughs> you know, off social media, how big a thing it actually really was, um, seeing everything on, you know, Twitter and everything and, and people contacting you, it's, you realise that it was, oh, my gosh, it was a lockout and it was huge. 
Yeah, I mean the the, the feeling was palpable uh, in the actual in the actual stadium, but like you know the crowd inside. What about the crowd outside? <laughs> They were buzzing as well. Yeah, it was. It got a really decent turnout as it, as it happens. I had um, one of my friends had to climb the fence to get in. Luckily, they got in. <laughs> it was quite an amazing evening. And uh, how do you reflect on that that season with Collingwood? Uh, obviously, that starting with that enormous high, um, but how did it unfold for you after that? Yeah, it was. Um, I don't think anyone was really ready for what it was going to be, uh, and I think there was. I mean, obviously, Adelaide got it right. Um, it's really hard. Like it's hard to know and hard to prepare for what you don't really know. Yes, it's a, a season of football, but it's different. It's sixteen on the field. It's a different game style. It's everything um, that that in, was involved. So um, we didn't really, you know, to be honest, we didn't really quite know how to prepare for it. And I think you know, in the end, it looked like we were probably a bit un, unprepared. Um, but it, it was by no fault or means of anyone, really. It was just that we didn't quite get it right and, and Adelaide did. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of a, a journey, a bit of an experience. But, you know, we enjoyed our first win at, um, at Witten Oval and um, a couple of wins after that. So we're, we're just happy we got a few wins. Yeah, absolutely. And now Beck Goddard, uh, one of us, which yes. is awesome to see. Very pleased with that recruit. We'll talk about her a, a little bit later. Um, shortly after that, the VFLW Premiership at uh, at Marvel, which uh, a joyous day for the Brown and Gold in, in both respects for both games. But um, I mean, what a win! Uh, what what are the first things that come to mind when you think of that day? Oh, it was just so much fun. It was you know a culmination of of a um, a wonderful year, um, and I was able to reconnect with a lot of people I'd played football with in the past. Um, but it was it really was a cherry on top to be honest for me, it was just such a great year um, to meet so many new people, be coached by such amazing people um, to be welcomed into and then um, become part of the Hawthorne family was in, was just a wonderful experience um, holistically. But then, yeah, the cherry on top was the the grand final and um, yeah, it all sort of came together and it was, um, yeah, I'd never played in the grand final before. So all right. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty special day and yeah, to get to obviously get to share it with Steph and, a few people that I played, you know, over fifteen years of football with was um was really really great. I feel like uh, Tiz, you might be able to confirm this, but we had um, Chantelle for best on ground. <laughs> we did from the stand, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, she's great. She's the ultimate professional. Um, we we call her a fond- no fondly as Baz, and um, she uh yeah she's the ultimate professional and and you know rose to the occasion on that day so. No, we're, we're really, really, really great mates. And I'm really thankful that Hawthorne has brought some really amazing people into my life. And uh, I just want to mention, you can actually watch the entire replay of that up on YouTube at the moment. Um, and there's a, a nice little highlights package as well so that someone's cut together for the club. Uh, well worth revisiting. And uh, yeah, fantastic win. I think one of my highlights is probably uh, Perkins' goal. I think to to shrug off. I think it was two or three players and get a snap away. She'll tell you it was five. Probably. <laughs> It's really that season which sort of cemented an ethos at Hawthorne and they started to build a, a brand and uh, we were denied a few times by AFL House. Um, but we're finally getting into the competition and I've been very impressed with how they've gone about creating a, a sort of, well, it is a brand, a sort of identity for, for the women's team. Um, how have they tried to do that because they've been conscious of of really embracing them into the Hawthorne style of of football and going about a footballing career haven't they yeah it's it's um it's been really really great to see the list build in action um I haven't been part of it myself but to see it unfold from uh, I guess internally from being in the VFL program um they've really gone for I think first, like knowing Beck, the way that I know her, she will always um, you know, go for a really great person and a really great human. Um, obviously, they have to be able to play football as well, but to to be a good human being and, and to be a really great person is really high up on her, her list. So I think what you see is you've got a, a great mix of um, experience in terms of you know, a lot of the girls that they've either – um, been able to acquire from other clubs or from within our VFLW program. And then, you know, you've got 
a really, really great bunch of the next generation of superstars that are going to come through. So those young kids are, are so lucky that they got these great people um, to, to look after them and to mentor them and to help them through. Um, and then, you know, you got the, the leaders that are going to set the tone. So it's, it's a fantastic um, group and, and I'm, I can't wait to see what they're going to do. Now, I noticed we had a few poached some of our talent got poached into state, but also I love the fact that uh, they've gone and and rewarded the commitment of a few and and put them on the AFLW list. Yeah, it's been um, it's been really really lovely to to see a lot of these girls that you know have been knocked back um, along their journey to to ply their trade at VFL level um, to you know put their egos ego, egos on the hook and when they come into the into the doors at VFLW level and just try and be the best players, the best people they could possibly be. And to get that reward um, to, to be promoted back onto the, onto an AFLW list and onto Hawthorne's inaugural AFLW list is, is really exciting. You know, I think of, you know, Tamara Luke, um, Ainsley Kemp, um, you know, just those two players to start with are fantastic. And then players who have, you know, were, were given some home truths at the end of the back end of the BFLW season last year and, and went and worked their backsides off and and got the reward as well and they've you know that's really really great to see that you know the feedback they're given they put it into action and um and they get the reward tell you what you mentioned tamara luke i felt like sometimes watching the team this year she just seemed unstoppable i thought where is the matchup i just she seemed capable of breaking open a game and being mvp consistently week to week i i thought it was a very exciting season at one stage I don't know, would it would have been 10 games? And then the only reason that that streak was broken, uh, that winning streak, was a draw uh, with the eventual premiers. Um, what about your view of the year from the position of player development mentor alongside uh, Chantel Pereira? Like, how do you reflect on this season? Yeah, it's, it was such a great season. I mean, I think the really big picture part of thing is that we've been able to provide an environment that's allowed players to grow and to become now AFLW players. You know, we've had 15 of our players go on to AFLW lists, whether or not that be at Hawthorne or at um, Sydney or Richmond now, um, also North Melbourne. So to have been in that being part of that environment and seeing those players grow. Um, but then also, you know, the next crop of, of talent that's going to be coming through. So we had a lot of Eastern Rangers and Gippsland girls come and play for us this year. They'll be so much better for having that experience next year. They've had a taste of it now. And my hope is that, you know, that's going to springboard their hopeful careers um, further forward. Now it'd be remiss of me not to ask about uh, your return match. Uh, (laughs) How did you go with that? That was a surprise, a welcome one. I remember at least for me from that match, you had the last kick of the game and boy, did they just want to play the song. <laughs> You're lining up for goal. And they had their trigger finger on, well, we're just going to play the club song. Don't worry about it. It was a bit mean. I wanted to start singing it when I was lining up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, look, it, it came as a surprise to me as well. Don't you worry. Um, look, I think, um, yeah, it, it, it was um, yeah, a bit of a surprise, but it came out of a, of a good thing as well in terms of you know our players becoming unavailable due to um, being promoted onto AFLW lists. So, um, you know, the thought process was that um, a lot of those players, so I think that was off the back of, you know, Tam, Luke, um, Ainsley. Oh, no, Ainsley was still playing at that point in time, but Jenna Richardson, a few players that had experience that didn't play anymore. Um, and I think it was off the back of just trying to, put a little bit of experience and leadership around um, those younger kids and just help them. So, um, yeah, it came a bit of a surprise to me. I'm glad we had a win. Um, <laughs> and um, Look, we got the W and I think importantly it gave us an opportunity to have a double chance in the finals. So more opportunity for our younger players to play in finals football um, and and just continually add to their experience. I'm curious about what would have been a tough call ahead of the final series with the overlap with the AFLW preseason. What was the feeling around the club? I can't imagine it would have been easy to make that call. Um, look, it was. I'm I'm sure um, decision makers made the call um, with a lot of thought behind it. But I think first and foremost, um, we needed to think of the players. Um, who are being promoted onto an AFLW list. And I think, you know, first and foremost, their um, 
fitness and health and 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 well-being is is really really important so yes getting onto a list but then knowing that their pre-season pre -season was going to start in four weeks time so you had to weigh up you know what is best for these players to give them the best opportunity to 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 be the best at the highest level and I think to be able to give them a break um, mentally and physically to prepare them um, for AFLW was really really important and I think it you know we we sort of talk about just gave more players an opportunity um, to to step out of a shadow, I guess, um, a wonderful shadow um, of, of these players, but step out of a shadow and actually, you know, give an opportunity to these players to play VFLW football, whereas they, they may not have previously. So, you know, your, your Caitlin Coxes may not have been drafted because um, an AFLW player may have been in that position um, and, and taken more of a leadership role, you know, so... Um, those sort of opportunities, you know, Charlie Granville as well, if we had our full list of players playing, I doubt she may have gotten a game for the VFLW level. So, you know, you've got to think of um, how, how many opportunities we can give to these people and um, what that's going to do for their development. So, yeah, it was a tough call, I'm sure. But um, I think if you look at it from a rounded holistic point of view it was a really really great call because a these players are well rested they feel fantastic heading into this preseason, but then also it gave opportunity to others to really step up I, I think the well-being aspect is you know very important the family club looking after its family is important for the Hawthorne brand and it's it's just the right thing to do I think people might they might um overlook the fact that we're talking about people with you know full well-rounded lives that aren't all just about football i know that the men's comp they might have the luxury of having that be their entire lives but we're, we're not there yet with the women's comps yet and yeah it, it just it pays to recognize that too about where things are at yeah definitely definitely look we're not we're not there yet we want to get there from a full-time point of view um but at the moment you know, yeah yeah the, these players are juggling full-time work study families um, and football commitment. So I think, you know, when the AFL season got brought forward, given the early start, you know, we had to say that our job probably is to, to support them and to support the players as best we can. Um, and by giving them a bit of time off, just allowed them to check in, I guess, with their, with their life outside of football before it all ramped up again. Let's move on to the AFLW. I imagine you, like us, watched the draft very keenly. I, you know these people intimately well. You, you know, obviously, the industry a bit better than us being on the outside looking in. How do you reckon we went? Because I think we did pretty well. But I wonder if there are any steals or surprises on the night, anything that delighted you. How do you reckon we went? Well, I uh, I was, at, at, well, finishing up at work, so I had an iPad going at full ball, trying to listen <laughs> to it while I was trying to do things. But, um, yeah, it was it was a great night. I mean, I think Mitch and... and um, you know, Mitch Cashin, who's our recruitment manager, Beck was heavily involved in the recruitment as well. They did a fantastic job. I mean, to have, you know, pre-draft really, to have all these picks available to them um, and to be basically done and dusted by pick 25 is pretty incredible. Um, you know, the, the talent coming through is fantastic. So I guess, you know, no matter who you pick within there, you're going to have a really, really great um, player and you back in that you, you, your culture and your system is going to be is going to get the most out of them. But I think you know we did incredibly well. Um, you know, even just having a small little interaction with some of these kids already, you know, they're going to be fantastic footballers. Their skills are incredible. I, I think one of the steals for us was Charlotte Baskerin. Um, you know, she was averaging over you know twenty eight odd disposals a game across the whole NAV competition. She's lightning fast. Um, yeah, and she's really, really athletic. So I think that was one of the steals. I think, um, but they're all going to be fantastic in their in their um, in their roles that they're going to play, and and I can't wait to to see them do their thing. Now, now Tiz and I were discussing uh, which number we would get on our AFLW Guernseys. Uh, we're undecided. Do you have any recommendations? Well, I, I have a few favourites. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, but they're more so ones that I've I've played with at at. Um, a VFLW level mm. um probably for me um because I was heavily involved in just her initial start at the club um yeah she came down from Darwin um and just 
just really, really worked their backside off is um, is Dom Carbone. So um, I, they haven't released the jumper numbers yet, so I'm not sure if I can say them, but um, <laughs> I think there's a close connection there between um, maybe not myself, but Steph. They will all help you do a little bit of digging um, as to what number she might be wearing. But okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Dom Carbone, I reckon she's she's one to watch. I guess we're, we're discussing what players... Uh, we might we might follow closely. I mean, in the men's, uh, you know, as as a listener, Meg, you might be aware that I'm very much a Mitch Lewis man. Uh, Tis very much a, a Connor Nash stand. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> what about the the analogous plays for our AFLW team? I mean, you know, Tis liking an attacking backman. I like a powerful forward target. Uh, any any plays in particular like we should really keep our eyes on? Oh, an attacking defender. <sighs> I think you want to look at someone like uh, Jenna Richardson mm-hmm. and uh, and Ainsley Kemp. She's she's tough and and goes really really hard at the contest. Um, I mean, how can you go past a tomorrow look for a big power forward? <laughs> yeah. In all honesty, I think Nick's already sold on that one. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say so. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow Luke and Sarah Perkins is going to be a bit of a nightmare for some opposition teams, I dare say. What about Ainsley Kemp, though? Fantastic year, and uh, to drift forward and kick that goal to produce one of my favourite celebrations in recent times. <laughs> it was special, that highlight. Yeah, Kemp is a, a really um, special human being. She's, you know, she's, she's been through a huge amount um, of adversity to get to where she is at the moment. You know, three knee reconstructions, um, and, and really, you know, tough going for her to, to get back to where she is. You know, I remember um, the practice match that we had out at Essendon, um, you know, in the preseason. That was her first game of football in over, you know, 500 or plus um, days. You know, for her just to get over that uh, and then to continually build on her season. Um, she's, a, she's an incredible human. Um, she's packed full of resilience and and toughness and um and i don't think she fully realizes what she's completely capable of but um everyone else believes in her a huge amount and and i can't wait to see her back where she belongs at aflw level yeah hawthorne have an inkling uh they they really like the look of her so uh, we're in very capable hands it must be said with beck goddard i want to know what it's like knowing her working with her she seems so intelligent and, and such a magnificent football brain and I think apart from the playing list I'm excited that we've got such a strong coaching staff yeah Beck um she's, she's incredibly intelligent um she's incredibly funny she's got very good one-liners um I have to pre-think about what I'm going to say to her before I say it to her I can't, I can't sort of just do it off the cuff because I need to kind of feel like I'm leveling up to an intelligence level with her. Um, nah, she, she's she's fantastic, and she's she's assembled a really great um, group of coaches to support her as well. Um, yeah, she's a she's an incredible leader of of people, um, particularly women as well. She's really strong in what she believes in, and, and clearly what she talks about as well. Um, she doesn't um, leave a word unsaid, and she's really passionate about Hawthorne and and, and women at Hawthorne as well so yeah we're we're in wonderful hands with Beck and um yeah she's uh she's she's very very funny <laughs> I, I think something that exemplifies her, her passion as well is the moment the fixture was announced just the other what two days ago uh, there was an article that came out move it to Marvel That's already it. she's on the front foot and we're all about that moving the the round one game against Essendon to, to Marvel right behind it um Meg, that's got to be a tantalising round one clash. That's exactly what us fans hoped for, and, and here we are. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, those people have only just seen VFLW, Hawthorne v um, Essendon, uh, would understand that there's already a rivalry there. Um, it stems back from our very, very first game that we ever played as women for Hawthorne. We played out at Windy Hill and we played against Essendon. So, um yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really really great opportunity to, you know, to to create a, this new era of the rivalry. Um, you know, so exciting, and and why not? Why not give the opportunity for you know over over sixty or seventy thousand Hawthorne fans and over I don't know I don't even know I don't really care how many <laughs> fans Essendon have. Um, you know, give both the 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 fans and supporter bases the opportunity to come and and see this new. 
um, the new era of the rivalry. It's it's super super exciting, and it's the, it's both clubs' debut at that level. So why not move it to Marvel and and fill it? Well, something we can learn from with that very first AFLW game is there's a cautionary tale in underestimating the, the fandom behind AFLW, and it's two new teams that really don't like each other. The fans the fans buy into it 100. percent The rivalry. I reckon move it to Marvel and uh, give people the chance. Absolutely. They will surprise you. I reckon it's going to get a great crowd. This game, you know, could be and should be a sellout. Um, you know, it's, it's as I said, it's it's a rivalry across both AFLW and AFLM now. Um, and, yeah, the, the thing that was learned and has been learned constantly throughout the seven years of AFLW is that don't underestimate the power of the people. Don't underestimate the power of women's football and, and what it can create and the movement that it can create as well. So um, I have no doubt the Hawthorne fans will turn up and I'm sure Essen will have no doubt that the Essendon fans will turn up. So, yeah, move it to Marvel. Give ourselves the best possible opportunity to to completely fill it and create an incredible experience for, for these players, for Hawthorne and Essendon, and that's what they deserve as well. They don't deserve, you know, they deserve to play on the best ground available. And last time I checked, Marvel's available that night. So, and uh, it's it's a great way for the AFL to build momentum for the season and and everything like that. They own they own the stadium now, so it shouldn't be too hard to get the <laughs> to get it, it on available. the night. <laughs> I I have a, a a strange question, I guess, but I noticed we picked up Lucy Wales from the Casey Demons. Uh, probably to play her as a ruckman. Now her twin is at Essendon, so uh, that that could be a nice little exchange. It could be. It could be a very very nice little exchange. Why not? It just adds another layer to the story, doesn't it? But what should our ex- expectations be for for a fledgling side? Do you think? I, I think that the the team wants to play an exciting brand of football that people want to come and see. Um, they want it to be a showcase of women's football. Um, you know, a, a attacking. It needs to be explosive. It needs to be fast. Um, and it, as I said, it needs to be something that people want to come and watch. But also, as a player, you want to play like that as well. You don't want to be a slow, you know, bogged down type of, of team. You want to be fast. You want to be exciting. Um, and you want to be a team that people always want to watch. So, um, yeah, I think it's you can always set the bar nice, nice and high. I think the expectation is, is that you just expect to see the players go out and give their absolute best and, and whatever comes from that is um, is going to be fantastic. I think the first year from what I learned being at Collingwood is that, yes, expectations may be high, um, but by and large, the supporters are just so happy to finally see um, women playing AFLW for their club. And I think that's that's one of the, one of the most important things. Yeah, I'm overjoyed to finally connect with this competition uh, a bit more than I was and it wasn't you know it was more the fact that my colors weren't out there that was the thing like I said I was there that that first game and I've attended many games since but it's not the same without Hawthorne like your heart's just not in it the same you've just been barracking for against North I should say <laughs> that's right for a long time <laughs> yeah no I happy to do that I went earlier this year I think it was Arden Street North versus Giants only too happy to barrack for GWS that day so <laughs> you basically would be supporting any team that had any connection to Hawthorne. So Phoebe was playing for Geelong, uh, Biso was playing for GWS. So any connection there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Meg, just to wrap things up, I, I want to get your take on some, some of the future directions in, in women's footy. This is season seven of the AFLW that we're heading into. How do you rate the, the health of the game, do you reckon? Oh, I think it's in great shape. I think... To see the, the competition finally expand to become 18 clubs is exactly what we want. Um, I think it will be a, a, a gradual incline now from here is that you know, the, the competition is going to get better and better and better because there is no further ex- expansion, which means there's the likelihood that players will stay at clubs for longer now and become um, more embedded in the club. You know, almost a, a franchise player, I guess, to an extent. Um, so I think where we are right now is exactly where we need to be. And I think the really exciting thing is, is that all the pathways are completely complete. 
the, the talent coming through is incredible. These young girls have played football basically as soon as they could have picked up a football now. There's no break in their, um, their development. There's no break in their football journey. And they can, as soon as they have a realisation that they want to have a goal of playing AFL, they can set their mind on it and, and go for it. So that's just, to me, the most exciting part is that we now have 18 clubs 18 clubs worth of spots for opportunity for players to play now. And I think we're just going to keep building. And as I said earlier, that the aim is, yeah, we do want to get to full time for our players because that's what they deserve. Um, but I think it's a step-by-step -step thing. I think the next, next thing would be to add more games in and then hopefully we can play every, every team once and then it becomes bigger and bigger. I was going to ask about your goals and things you'd like to see moving forward. Was there anything in addition to that? I know full time is a is a big shared goal for a lot of people in the industry. But is there anything that you personally would want to see? Well, personally, I want to see every club um, play each other once. Um, that therefore creates an element of fairness across the whole competition. Um, look, to be honest, I, I'm quite kind of happy we're not playing Melbourne in our first year that's okay with me <laughs> we, you know if, you, if all our cards fall right we might play them in the finals who knows yeah. but um yeah I think that's initially what the what my aim is to start with is that every club plays each other once that becomes a fair competition and then it builds from there um you know the timing of the season I don't I don't know where it sits I don't know what is the right time but as long as it um aligns with the second tier competition that'd be really handy as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah there needs to be some some better admin but i think they're just playing it by ear and changing things around at the moment aren't they just trying to fit what works and yeah i think summer they've played around with summer um whether or not it goes back to there i'm not sure um but i know now that they've got the 18 clubs they can build from here and then they can um, either shift it forward or back. But I think what we'll find is that it's going to have some element of games across August, September, October, November-ish um, and have a bit of a crossover there. Now, Meg, I've got a bit of a wildcard question for you. Not dissimilar to, uh, you know how at the end of a news bulletin they might have like uh, a squirrel on skis or like a, a Labrador doing something cute? Well, I just want to end in a real feel-good way because I think this is fantastic. Your retirement game for Hawthorne VFLW not only getting the win, but a fairy tale finish with a goal, getting the on-field celebration with your wife Steph. Talk us through that moment. That that is sports magic right there. It was, to be honest, the most perfect way to finish everything. Um, you know, I was so content with everything that I've achieved in my football career. All I really wanted um, was to have fun and enjoy myself and have a really great last game. Um, everything that that we did on the day was just incredible. The club and, and the players and Beck just, they, they just made me feel so special and it was the most special day. Um, and, you know, Port Melbourne were, were playing finals or looking to play finals that year. So, you know, our season was was done. That was a, going to be our last game of the year. Um, so we gave it everything and, and to be able to knock off a club that was above us um, it was, was, was just so special, but to be able to play with some of these young kids, to be able to play with Tam, Luke again, with Chantella again, you know, and have past players come and visit and watch and, and be part of it. It was just a really, really special, um, really, really special day. And I'm just really glad that the ball hit my foot really well and it went through. <laughs> <laughs> A fitting end, and a fitting end to this to this interview. Um, to discard my professionalism for one second, you've been a bloody delight, Meg. It's been great having you on. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was um, yeah, really really fun to be part of. I really appreciate it, guys. Did you want to plug anything that we can tack on? You, is there anything you want to promote? Oh, I just like all Hawthorne supporters to to really just get behind our AFLW team. You know, buy a membership, be part of it, be part of the journey. Um, you know, from my experience again at, at another AFLW program. The journey itself is just the most rewarding thing to be part of. So get on board, buy a membership, support these girls. They're amazing people, amazing human beings, and they're just so appreciative of everything that they get. So um, 
yeah and get to training on saturday it'll be fantastic another another open session yes open training indeed uh saturday august 27 that's round one essendon versus hawthorne at etu stadium for now certainly we'll do something about that 7 10 p.m uh and yeah buy membership starting at 50 bucks you get every game i'm gonna be on board tiz will be on board and uh we'll see you there meg thank you fantastic go Hawks. So exciting it is to, to chat to a special guest that knows footy back to front, but especially uh, is involved in women's football. And that is really what's on the agenda at the moment. As I said, the fixture has just come out. We're very much looking ahead to our inaugural season, the AFLW. And uh, our hearts can be in it. We have a Hawthorne side and uh, we're riding the wave. Finally, we stand down the AFL house. We've got our football inside. We're going ahead full steam and uh, we're going to declare where the game is going to be held as well. So uh, they're becoming increasingly irrelevant. <laughs> oh, I can tell that got under your skin, those comments from Kane Corns. He wants, he wants Tom Mitchell at his club. Well, they're going, to have to, they're going to have to stump up the money, Chief. Give us some picks. So, so he wants Port Adelaide to prize Tom Mitchell out of irrelevancy. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't really understand it myself. But uh, I was a little frustrated by Meg, who wouldn't give up the jumper numbers. Uh, that was <laughs> <laughs> all in good time, mate. It's part of the journey, isn't it? It's all a part of the excitement as we build towards the AFLW season. Uh, we want to thank Meg once again for joining us as we look to wrap up this edition of the Hawk Talk podcast. Uh, maybe you're listening to this via Spotify. Perhaps you've elected to stream it. Um, perhaps you've elected to stream it via Audible, or you could be using Apple. In which case, if you could take a second to leave our show a rating or a review via Apple Podcast, that'd be wonderful. We'd really appreciate that. If you haven't done so already as well, join us on Twitter and Facebook. We've celebrated a couple of massive milestones in the past week. Literally thousands, tears. This is something I thought of this week. It was really quite surreal when it hit me. We have literally thousands of people connecting with what we do in one big Hawk Talk podcast community, all united behind these teams. So uh, get on board at twitter.com slash hawktalkpod and facebook.com slash hawktalkpod. Join the community. And uh, indeed, make sure you find us on Instagram as well. Now, this one's important. Keeping the lights on at Hawk Talk Pod HQ and creating content is made possible by our wonderful Patreon subscribers. You too can support us and uh, score some sweet bonus content in the process by hopping onto patreon.com slash hawktalkpod. You can sign up for as little as, say, the price of a cup of coffee and make a very real contribution to making the show what it is. All the details are online. Simply jump onto patreon.com slash hawktalkpod. So I'm going to see you on, on Saturday with the special sauce and the special uh, chicken salt that they have at Marvel. Well, I hope you bring a tent because the game's on Sunday. Did I? What day did I say? Saturday, and I'm leaving it in. I'll be there from Saturday. <laughs> uh, and then when, when Sunday rolls around, uh, you'll toddle on in. And uh, I don't know, could be a, a good game to watch. I hope it is. I hope the players, I hope the coaching staff do one-on-ones and just see exactly what they've got in front of them because uh, Adelaide has just as many hard decisions as we have by the end of the year. Well, it should be an entertaining game, I think. You're looking at both sides that are trying to find their blueprint. They're trying to work out what they're going to be going forward. And uh, I do believe, as far as I know, that Adelaide, their MO is quite similar to ours in the way that we want to play the game. We want an attacking style of game. We want an entertaining style of game. And uh, that should put, it should tear the defensive lines to shreds, which uh, will be interesting, especially for a Mitch Lewis fan such as myself. Excellent. So we're expecting both teams to turn up, are we? Could be fun. Could be. Could be in the works. Some big, heavy scoring at Marvel Stadium. That's 3.20pm Sunday. This has been another edition of the Hawk Talk Podcast. We'll be back next week to recap all the action. Thanks once again to our special guest, Meg Hutchins, for joining us. What a delight she was. And thank you, Tiz. Thank you, listeners. We are a happy team at Hawthorne.